Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome everyone to this week's session of Law as Science and our very first session of the Law as Science Spring 2024 series. I am Marilyn Hajj, SJD candidate at UVA School of Law. I will serve as your moderator for this session. Before turning to, the, to today's esteemed speaker, Professor John Monahan, let me briefly introduce the Law as Science project. Law as Science is an academic initiative coordinated by a group of JSD, JSA, JSD candidates from across the United States who share the same belief in legal methodologies. Legal methodologies are often understood as a discipline distinct from sciences, traditionally consisting of doctrinal analysis and normative questions. Through this series of interdisciplinary talks, we aim to show that legal research can be improved and benefit from scientific methodologies that provide systematic ways to approach questions. If you want to learn more about our project, please visit our website and join our email list. One of our awesome coordinators will drop the links in the chat. Speaking of our coordinators, I would just like to take a brief moment to introduce the team. We have Simon Sun, SJD at Indiana University, Moore School of Law, and co-founder of this initiative. We have Daniel Hafke, who is an SJD candidate at Cornell Law. He's going to make it so close to finishing. We've got Vanessa Villanueva, who's a senior fellow at Law and Science and the chief editor of our blog, The Legal Method Lab. I would also like to give a very special shout out to the legal research forum here at UVA Law. Thank you to Geronimo Alberti, the president, for sharing our event with other UVA students interested in scholarship and research. We also have many representatives from diverse law schools in the United States, such as Berkeley, UPenn, University of Illinois, Georgetown, University of Washington, Columbia, and Fordham. If you're interested in getting involved with us, we're always looking for new law and science representatives. We also host a blog on legal methodology named the Legal Method Lab, and we're always on the lookout for new editors. So if you're interested in becoming either a representative or an editor, please reach out to us. But enough with the shameless marketing. Let's turn to today's speaker. John Monahan, a psychologist, teaches and writes about how courts use behavioral science evidence, violence, risk assessment, criminology, and mental health law. He is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has served on the National Research Council. Professor Monahan was the founding president of the American Psychological Association's Division of Psychology and Law and has been a fellow of the John Simon Guggenheim, Guggenheim Foundation and the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. He has also been a visiting fellow at several law schools, including Harvard, Stanford, NYU, and the American Academy in Rome, in Rome uh, the All Souls College in Oxford. He twice directed research networks for the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, in 1997, he received an honorary law degree from the City University of New York. Professor Monahan is the author or, and or editor of only 17 books and more than 300 articles and chapters. His work has been cited more than 30,000 times. One of his books, Social Science and Law, one of my personal favorites, co-authored with Lawrence Walker, is now in its 10th edition and has been translated into Chinese. Two of his other books won the Manfred Gutmacher Award of the American Psychiatric Association for Outstanding Research in Law and Psychiatry. Monahan's work has been cited frequently by courts, including the California Supreme Court in the landmark case of Tarasov versus Regents and the US Supreme Court in Barefoot versus Estelle, in which he was referred to as the leading thinker on the issue of violence risk assessments. In today's talk, Professor Monahan will discuss what he has been studying and writing about for decades now, the many uses of social science evidence in American law. This is at the core of what we do here at Law and Science, since it looks at the law through the lens of other disciplines, namely the social sciences. As a scholar myself, it was Professor Monahan who taught me to look beyond the codes and the textbooks and to look for evidence where a jurist would least expect to find it. So on a very final note, we will have a Q&A segment at the end of the session. So please stay till the end, prepare some questions. We look, for, we look forward to a tantalizing conversation with you. Without further ado, Professor Monahan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marilyn. I appreciate those uh, remarks. Um, as Marilyn said, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a psychologist. I teach courses in how courts use social science research, and that's what I want to talk about uh, today. 
first a brief comment about the history of American courts use of social science. It began in 1907 in the case of Muller versus Oregon. The case was argued by a famous lawyer, Louis Brandeis, after whom Brandeis University uh, has been mentioned. Uh, the case had to do with a statute prohibiting women from working more than 10 hours a day in a factory or a laundry. Brandeis had to show that the Oregon legislature acted, quote, rationally, quote, when they passed this statute. He did this by submitting a brief that consisted of one paragraph of law and 113 pages of empirical studies that concluded that having mothers and daughters work more than 10 hours per day hurt the women and hurt their families as well. The court in Muller versus Oregon cited Brandeis's brief and concluded that the empirical research cited, quote, may not, technically speaking, be authorities, yet they are a significant indication of a widespread belief that a woman's physical structure justifies special legislation restricting the conditions under which she should be permitted to toil. Since Muller versus Oregon in 1907, social science research has been cited in many thousands of cases. These cases fall into three broad categories. First category is social science used to determine facts. The second category is social science used to determine law. The third category is social science used to provide context. So there we go. Let's look at here. Hang on one second. Uh, get rid of this. Boom. Social science used to determine facts, right? We're only going to consider one type of fact, only trademark law, and the issue is consumer confusions. Under the Trademark Act, a person can't register a new trademark if that new trademark so resembles an existing trademark, quote, as to be likely when used in conjunction with the goods of the applicant to cause confusion, to cause mistake, or to be to, to deceive. If a party sells a product, likely to cause confusion with an existing trademark, the party is guilty of trademark infringement. If the plaintiff, the party with the existing trademark, can prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the defendant, the newcomer, is causing consumers to be confused, an injunction can be issued to stop the newcomer from selling his or her products, and money damages can be awarded. So the Trademark Act on its face calls for empirical data about whether or not consumers are confused. So. First look at uh, some of the uh, cases that have early cases in trademark law. Here's the uh, plaintiff, the existing trademark, Elgin, this case of Elgin National Watch Company, right, 1928. This people, the Elgin people had their trademark on this and the newcomer had a trade, had a clock that looks like this. And if you put them together, look at the existing mark, and the new mark, the issue was, will consumers be confused? And if you can see, they're similar in a lot of ways, but they're not exactly uh, the, the exact same. So uh, in this case, uh, the Elgin National Watch Company, the plaintiff sued the Elgin Clock Company for making uh, clocks for cars that use the word Elgin, right? Um, so you can look at what the differences there would be. The Elgin National Watch Company, the plaintiff petitions the court for permission to file an affidavit from an expert witness about, quote, the meaning of the word Elgin as understood by the public. The affidavit here had 2,000 questionnaires attached to it as, quote, exhibits. exhibits. The first impression, no one had ever tried to introduce a survey before in uh, a case like this. You could wonder why the judge didn't just decide this. Uh, him or herself, the issue of confusion, just look at the watch and say, are they be confusing? But the uh, issue here is uh, the judge didn't decide this because the issue is consumer confusion, not judicial confusion, right? So what they did was they did a survey of people who sold these kind of clocks, right? And they asked, do you think, is it, are people going to, uh, to be confused, right? And people, this again, in 1928, uh, the court just said, we just can't, we just don't know what to do with these things. Well, right. But if you look at, subsequently look at this uh, case here, um, or, uh, Oneida case, coronation, here's the plaintiff, existing silver, and you can see the how the fork looks. And if you here's the defendant, the newcomer, here's how that fork looks. And if you look at them together, the issue is, I mean, they seem very 
similar, you know, but this is a little different here, and this is a little uh, uh, different uh, there. They make silverware with this uh, here. Uh, so if you look at these side by side, you can see what the similarities are. Oneida said that the national silver is causing consumer confusion and asks for an injunction to tell them to stop this and wants financial advantages. Right? They had a number of people working on this, right? And the respondents, they did a survey, right? Uh, and the survey was, they figured, well, who, who buys silverware? It's probably in most households, it's going to be women. So they just surveyed uh, women here, right? Uh, the results of this survey, when people were handed the Princess Royal uh, here, this they were handed this, right? Uh, they asked uh, a thousand women, who do you think makes this? And everybody said it was Oneida made it. Only one person out of the thousand had it correct that it was national silver, right? So they, that's worked uh, very, uh, very well in this case. You can look at other cases like this. Look at Domino's Pizza versus Domino's Sugar, for example. And Domino's Sugar argues that no, people are going to be confused by the Domino's word. And the court basically said, no, no one's going to be confused between pizza and sugar. So it doesn't really make any difference, right? Uh, look at this case, right? Uh, kiss, the cookie. Kiss photo versus photo fantasy. Plaintiffs kiss here uh, and the defendant photo fantasy, but both own photo booths and shopping malls across the country. Photo fantasy allows customers to scan a picture of a celebrity and has pictures of Tom Cruise outside his booths called portrait booths. Kiss charges that the scanning process violates the Land and Trademark Act by confusing consumers into thinking that photo fantasy booths are somehow associated with Tom Cruise, and this confusion leads consumers to go to photo fantasy rather than to others like Kiss's photo booths, right? So there's, there's uh, Tom Cruise there. They hire a, a social scientist to do a study to demonstrate consumer confusion. Photo fantasy objects to this and wants to exclude the testimony of the expert. Right. If you look how Dr. The expert here did a study, he went to a mall, selected about 250 people for the study. He selected them to match the demographics of people who go to photo fantasy booths. Doesn't say what dimensions he matched on, but I would expect some things like age, gender, and race. And he randomly selected subjects in one of two conditions. Each subject was given an envelope with the same survey material, one difference. The experimental group had a picture of Tom Cruise inside and the other group did, uh, did not. The control group envelope doesn't have any picture in it, right? And what you see is the results of this study, right? The experimental group, Tom Cruise sketch in the survey materials, yeah, 56% believe that Tom Cruise endorses this product. They had a control group that didn't get the picture of Tom Cruise, only 7% of the people. They must believe that Tom Cruise just endorses everything, I guess. So if you look at that, the net confusion rate, 49% of the people ultimately were confused. And they had to, uh, so the, the, um, the that, that did establish that there was a consumer uh, confusion there, right? Uh, so if you look at other instances of consumer confusion, here's like a, Probably the makers of products are very, very careful uh, to keep their words from becoming generic. If you use Xerox, the way you use aspirin, we get a headache. The word aspirin used to be a trademark, but it's not anymore. No one thinks of a specific answer. Boy, what a headache. And all because some of you may be using our name as a generic manner, which could cause it to lose its trademark status the way aspirin did years ago. So when you do use our name, please use it as an adjective to identify your products and services, like Xerox copiers, never as a verb two Xerox in place of two copies, or as a noun, Xerox is in place of copies. Thank you. Now, excuse us, we have to lie down for a few minutes, right? Well, here's another one, Xerox. If you use Xerox the way you use zipper, our trademark would be left wide open, right? And if you see what that was, zipper was indeed once upon a time trademark, but now, of course, it's, uh, it, it is uh, generic. There's no question about that, right? Um, Look at what's so that I think is in terms of one use of social science, uh, in terms of that we we just went over. Let's look another. Let's look at gender segregation and the use of social science to make law. Right here's Justice Ginsburg, and she was she was getting a big uh, award uh, uh, right there, and what the issue was a Virginia Military Institute, which was an all male uh, institute, right, and uh, the issue was should 
Virginia Military Institute admit women. That was the big uh, issue. Finally, and lower courts said, well, it's got to be resolved someday, but we don't know what to do. But finally, it got to the United States Supreme Court. And you could see how Justice Ginsburg, in her opinion for the majority, deals with research findings on gender differences. Ginsburg puts down all data on mean group differences between males and females. She puts the word findings on gender differences. She puts the words findings in sarcastic quotation marks. Justice Ginsburg does not like the use of the term tendencies by the state's expert witnesses at trial. She calls them fixed notions. Instead of mean differences between men and women, she emphasizes the overlap in gender distributions. Some women, some women, some women uh, do this, right? Uh, and she stays a, a lot of time on that, right? In footnotes, in one of the footnotes in Justice Ginsburg majority opinion, she says, if adjustments are needed to physical training standards when women are admitted, these adjustments in training standards are, quote, manageable. Just do it. And if you'd see here in terms of uh, Virginia Milligan's gender normed fitness test on sit-ups, you have to get 60% right to get it, right? So you see there's no gender difference whatsoever, right? Men can... 100% of the men can do these 92 uh, sit-ups and 92% per, of, of the women. And all you have to do is 60%. The men do 60 and the women do 60. So there's absolutely no gender difference in sit-ups. However, you look at pull-ups. Men can do a lot more pull-ups than women can. Men to score 100 on this test, they have to do 20 pull-ups. Women only have to do eight. To pass the test and get a score of 60%, men have to do five pull-ups. Women only have to do one pull-up. Right? If you look at running a mile and a half run, get 100% for men, score 100. They have to do it in eight minutes and 30 seconds. Women have to do it in nine minutes and 46 seconds. To pass at a 60%, men have to do it in 12 minutes and 30 seconds, where women get 14 minutes and 20 seconds. So there were big gender differences uh, there, right? And, and the court basically says, well, this is just the way it is. And the law has been changed uh, several years ago to, uh, it changed in uh, 2018, 11 years after women were first introduced into Virginia Military Institute, rather than having them fail out by not being able to do some of these exams, they just changed uh, the slides on all this, right? Plainly, if you look at social science used to provide context, violence risk assessment, which is the area that I personally uh, work in uh, uh, a lot, right? So you look at pretrial risk assessment in Virginia, for example. Virginia is the home of this pretrial risk assessment, right? Then you develop these things uh, empirically. So you check whatever you think, what could possibly predict whether there'll be uh, violence or whether people just won't show up. And you put, you try to measure as many of those as you can, and then you just see which ones actually work. You drop out the ones that don't predict and you leave in the ones that do. So it turns out in this Virginia pretrial risk assessment instrument, at one point, if you're charged with a felony, one point, if you have pending charges, when you committed this crime, you were also charged with something else before, have a criminal history, you get one point. If you fail to appear, Two or more times, you get two points for that. If you've been two or more times been convicted of a violent crime, you get a point for that. Length at your residence, right? The longer you've lived at the same place, that's good because you're probably unlikely to leave, right? If you're uh, unemployed, if you're not employed, or if you're not a primary caregiver for children, that's a bad sign because then maybe you're going to just run and you have a history of drug abuse. If you look at here, and then you categorize these risk levels. So low is zero or one, below average is two, average is three, above average is four, and high is between five and nine. If you look at there, uh, look at and how this has actually worked. The people who are low risk, when you do this, a new 86.7% uh, uh, success, 1.6% of the time they fail to appear, 11.7% of the time they're new arrested. And if you see in terms of the risk level, right, so that the success level uh, here goes from low 86.7, then below average 81.9, average 72.5, above average 67.2, and high, right, 
uh, risk, then you're down to 70, 63.5% rather than, for example, on low 86.7. There's a failure to appear. You're low risk at 1.6% of those people are not going to show up. Below average, 4.1% of the people are not going to show up. Average, 5.8% of the people don't show up. Above average, 66 .6, and their high risk is 7.0. The new arrest and see low risk, 11.7 goes up to 14%, 21.7, 26.2, 29.3. So, I mean, by, by no means whatsoever is this perfect, right? The people who are low risk, it's not as if they're like 0% uh, failure to appear, or 0% of the new arrest, but there's no question that, let's uh, say, for, in terms of a new arrest, 29.5 is a lot bigger than 11.7. So this is one of the kinds of things that are taken into account in deciding this risk level. And what the, then what the law does is, right, you detain the people at high risk and you release the people before trial. Mind you, they haven't been convicted of anything in these charges yet, but the issue is you keep them in jail uh, before they're tried. And if you're low risk uh, police, they release 89.3% of the low risk people and they detain 10.7% of the low risk people. Below average, they release 77.3% of the people, and they keep 22.7. Average, release 70.6, and they detain 38.9. Above average, uh, they release 61.1, and they detain 38.9. The high risk, they would get least, uh, high risk is about 50-50, and, and that's, that's pretty it's pretty risky. So that they take into account in making these decisions. So mind you, there's still a lot of human judgment involved. Even the people who are high risk on this instrument, half of those people get out. And maybe they can have, they have a, a, a spouse maybe who are, is, they trust to uh, make sure this guy doesn't uh, skip town. But uh, it really makes a huge difference in terms of, now, and if you compare this stuff with people's subjective judgment, I mean, this is vastly better, vastly better than people's uh, subjective uh, judgments. There's no, uh, no question um, about that uh, at all, right? And if you look at, here, look at the Arnold Foundation has produced this instrument. This instrument is used in many, many places, right, uh, across the country. Uh, okay, PS to PS, it measures three things that, uh, you know, the risk assessment scale. PSA measures three. Risk of failure to appear, FTA, using a scale of one to six. Risk of new criminal activity, NCA, using a scale of one to six. Risk of a new violent criminal activity, using a yes, no. Right. And what you see here, just look at the uh, risk factors here. So the, on top, on the right-hand side, FTA is failure to appear, NCA is new criminal activity, and VCA is new violent criminal activity. And the things that are checked off are what, what is actually predicted here. And age at first arrest predicts new criminal activity, uh, younger uh, adult age. The younger you are, the more likely it is your cr new criminal activity. Current violent offenses, that's statistically indicative of you're going to commit a new violent offense. Or some of these things can be judged together. Current violent offense and you're 20 years old or younger, then that is going to predict violent activity. The pending charge at the time of the offense, that predicts everything. It predicts failure to appear, new criminal activity or new violent criminal uh, activity. Right? Uh, uh, prior misdemeanor uh, conviction, you can see predicts new criminal activity. Prior felony conviction predicts new criminal activity. Right. Uh, if you also have a, another prior conviction, right, uh, that's going to predict these two things, failure to appear and new violent criminal activity. Uh, if you look at have you been convicted of violent crime in the past, that commits new criminal activity and new violent criminal activity. Failure to appear before trial in the past two years, well, that predicts whether you're going to show up this time, and it also predicts new criminal activity. Failure to appear at pretrial more than two years ago, well, that predicts uh, failure to appear again. And prior sentence to incarceration, that predicts new criminal activity as well. So you think all those things are taken uh, into account. And if you look at how you know, the failure rate, rate score, right? Uh, and you look at in terms of failure to appear, if you score one, you have a 12% failure to appear. If you score six on that, you have a 30% odds of failure to appear. 
Again, 12% is not zero, and 30% is certainly not 100. But if every study that's actually trying to compare these statistical devices with human judgment of people who are experienced who are not using some kind of statistical device, uh, uniformly, you find these statistical devices are much better than human intuition, much, much better than, than human intuition. If you look at here, new criminal activity, again, if you score well, one on the scale, you have a 9% chance of a new criminal activity. And if you score six, you have a 52% chance. So slightly greater than one out of two. That's about the most you're going to get uh, from these scales. But again, this is vastly, vastly, vastly better than unstructured uh, uh, human judgment. And if you look at here, which say new violent criminal activity, if you score one, you get here to 1.3% will commit a new violent crime. Whereas if you score six, it's uh, it goes from 1.3 to 10, right? So that's no question. Here's here's where they, they draw the uh, the cutoff there. And in terms of new violent criminal activity, well, there really isn't too much violent crime. So that's divided this way. If you a flag, if you score between one and three, there's no violence flag. 95% of the people are there. The violence rate is 2.5%. But if you score between four and six, right, new violent criminal activity there, then uh, only 5% of the subjects, but 8.4% of those people commit a new violent crime. So 8.4 is a lot bigger than 2.5. I mean, it's just many. Uh, so this is actually being used in many, many places. And I think this is a, uh, a really very significant uh, result of, of the use of social science. And there are other uses of social science, for example, in trying cases, for example, in jury selection, social science is often used to uh, select uh, jury members. It can be used to decide on, on plea bargains. It can be used for all kinds of different researches, research projects. But I think that in general, these are the big use of social science in uh, in courts. So I think we have we will have ample time for discussion because I think this is going to be it. So Marilyn, how would you like to proceed? So if you're, if you're, yeah, if you're done with the presentation, we can open the floor up for a Q and A. Yeah. Um, I would like to start with the first question, which, which is given the development of these risk, risk assessments, were there ever um, empirical experiments conducted to assess the accuracy of these risk assessments themselves? Just as you say earlier before these instruments? Oh, no, I mean, like once these instruments were developed, um, were they ever like every maybe 10 years? Is there a way to assess that they're still no, that's, accurately that's predicting outcomes? Well, I think that there is uh, uh, issues where you try to re-possess uh, them and you said, well, maybe the scoring should be different. Well, maybe we should give four points rather than three points. And things can be different in different parts of the country. Maybe this just predicts in certain kinds of uh, states and maybe in other locations in the country, it doesn't. So there may be all kinds of ways to constantly uh, work on improving these things. And in fact, there is more stuff that's uh, gone on just uh, very recently. And I think that the improvements tend to be not as big as they were uh, initially. Those are the really big uh, differences, but it tends to, uh, I think there keep being improvements on this uh, um, a lot. A lot of improvements on this, yes. So we have Simon who has a question. Yes. Um, so thank you so much for uh the presentation. Um and um I, I do have a lot of a lot of sort of we think about the, the, the interaction between science and law here quite often. And I think this is the first um session about sort of the evidence part um and how that impacts um sort of the judiciary system um and, and this connects to sort of my background when i when it comes to ai and law um my, my research is mostly about artificial intelligence um and one of the issue um question that that we've encountered um is specifically about risk assessment um is using uh, different types of algorithmic um systems um and to score uh, people um, and then there's the issue of bias. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the case of Compass as a way to differentiate, um, sort of to, to conduct a risk assessment. And then there's certain biases um, 
among a uh, sort of dif different ethnic group. Um, and, and and so there is that impact. So, so I was wondering um, sort of your perception about algorithmic bias. Um, do you see this as a new issue, something that we need to tackle in the future? Um, and 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 maybe like how should we sort of encounter that um, sort of um, sort of drawback in a lot of trust sort of in the system itself? Would transparency be a good result to move forward? Better data, or uh, just would love to hear sort of your general idea about uh, the issue of algorithmic bias um, when it comes to risk uh, assessment here. Right. Well, I certainly think that there uh, there can be bias in these circumstances, but I know that every study that has tried to compare bias in uh, human judges, not using these statistical instruments, and these statistical instruments, these statistical instruments are much, much less biased than unstructured clinical judgment. Right. So that's a question of how much bias you want to tolerate, and I think these things have uh, are the way to go if you want to reduce uh, bias. I think that the big uh, development in this field, and very recently, very recently, is uh, uh, when you use all kinds of uh, automatic, different types of prediction uh, instruments. Uh, and I think that the future may indeed uh, hold major developments here in terms of how, how good these things are uh, to, to, uh, to predict. And one issue that comes up a lot is a lot of the things that might predict in certain circumstances are not the individual's, quote, fault, quote. So these things, their goal is not to say how morally blameworthy you are, but are you going to do it again? And if you were, so for example, so for recent one, if you uh, were beaten often by your parents when you were a child, that clearly predicts whether or not you are going to be violent you person are going to be violent in the future. Well, I mean, in some way, we should just be really sorry that the person was beaten by uh, his father when he was a child. But that doesn't change the issue that this person is more likely to do it again. We can't undo the fact that he was beaten as a child. You can't do what if any of that's going to predict in the future, then it is bothersome that you, in a sense, you are holding, you are punishing people more because they were abused by their parents than you would be otherwise. And that is uh, very bothersome from a moral point of view, but if really, if you can't undo that. So really, if what you want to do is predict, is this person likely to do it again? You have to take into account these kinds of uh, risk factors. Yeah. All right, thank we you have... so much. We have Daniel as a question, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so the question goes into a completely different direction, but okay. um, I'm I'm interested basically in your first example, which was the example like of polling um, in the trademark disputes. Yeah, um, which I found totally interesting because we always, um, I mean, we always have these figures in law uh, or in jurisprudence like the rational consumer, yeah. um, and I know from like I'm from Germany, and in Germany we have this very weird. Um, construct of um, sufficiently aesthetically educated people. So it's always like if you want to build something, um, the question if it fits in is would a sufficiently um, aesthetically educated person find it offensive, right? Which is, I think, code for uh, would this personal judge find it offensive? Um, and as you said, like there's some true value basically in taking this out of like out of the hands of the judge to have like a clearly subjective um, judgment um, and basically just ask people, right? You are the rational consumers. What what are your takes on that? So I, I see like the, why that would be very attractive. Um, on the other hand, um, I mean, as you know, there's like a lot of issues with with polling, right? Espe especially with, uh, with issue polling. So um, um, depending on how you phrase questions, you get very different results. Um, obviously, like people in political science are very aware of that. And um, we have the thing when we do political polls that um, you get very different results depending on um, basically who's doing the kind of research and who uh, uh, how they frame the question. So my question then would be, um, knowing of basically this this risk of, of issue polling and, and question phrasing, um, do 
how do courts treat the fact when like basically one of the two sides brings in um, objective data, which is then polling data? Um, how should judges treat that um, kind of um, knowing that kind of the uh, the phrasing matters a lot? Uh, and obviously, this will basically give give um, the expertise to an uh, to an imagined objective person, but it's really like the the objective person that is paid by one of the uh, one of the people um, of the dispute, right? Right. Well, I think it's a great question. Um, one issue that comes up uh, a lot is if first first the, uh, the party who seems to be hurt by the study objects to admitting it and try, finds all kinds of things. Uh, wrong with it. But what you often, what the really best way to do is when the other side does its own polls. Say if we change the way this was uh, addressed or if you change it from a five point scale to a three point scale, that that changes the results. I think and what's really good is if you have two sides, both of whom do empirical research, and then it's up to the court or in a jury case, it's up to the jury to decide which of these these two ways is the best way to uh, to do it. Some of these surveys also sample very small groups of people. Other surveys uh, sample thousands of people. So I think it's in some ways it's a battle of the experts. And uh, oftentimes courts, and I say this teaching at the law school. I mean, a lot of uh, judges know are not at all expert in quantitative methods, right? Uh, at all, but but I think that the the best survey is if you don't like the survey that the other side did and you think that that's biased, well that's fine. Do your own, do your own survey. Change the words in a way that you think they should be better. And if you find the confusion or the lack of confusion or what you want, then I think it's up to the uh, courts as to. I mean, this is and sometimes if the survey research is really bad, the courts just say this is trash. The jury's not going to hear this. This is just ridiculous. But other times it's say, okay, good points. You know, it's not perfect. So you can present this and the other side can criticize the research. But ideally the way is if both sides do their own research, then it can be up to the courts to determine, okay, which of these has been done better. And I think that that doesn't happen nearly as much uh, as it should, because as you know, some of these surveys cost, uh, you know, a lot of money, especially if they're going to be uh, thousands or hundreds of people in it. So I think that um, that's one of the ways that it can best be handled. Just get it all out in the open and both sides do their own research. Uh, can I ask a short follow-up, Marilyn? Uh, yes, if it's short. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, uh, just, just very briefly, um, how does that then translate to basically the education of judges? Right, because that would uh, presuppose that judges need to be able to um, judge what kind of uh, research is proper research uh, and what kind of uh, isn't. Or do you think it would mean that we just get political scientists, psychologists um, to the courts um, and they should assess whether it's a good use of polling, a bad use of polling, good use of social science? Yeah, well, I think that's, uh, uh, again, a really great question. The problem is that, uh, you know, it, it's a lot to law. I mean, just getting the law down, I mean, takes an enormous amount of work. But a lot of people say that there's no way that people are going to know all there is to know about the law and a lot about social science. I mean, there is some. So uh, at the University of Virginia, we have one uh, psychologist on the faculty. That's me. And several people are JD, PhD, maybe three or four. And also we have one uh, economist who's not a lawyer on the faculty. And economics in many ways has... Uh, succeeded in law school much, much more than psychology has. So, but I think that um, uh, you just got to do the best you can. It would be great if there was more legal uh, education, but I, we used to have a summer judges program and some judges would get some degree if they came for two summers and study this. And I overheard one saying judges, so it's one to another, said, I will never, ever cite social science research again, because all you get is criticized. So we have Tsang Shan Chen next. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Is... Yes, we can yes. hear you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, I have uh, two short questions. And the first one is related to, it's the, follow it's the following our questions about your conversation with Simon. I have a question, the question is, I wonder if there are any circumstance in which like we should not use, the court should not use social science to, to decide. 
uh, the, the, the evidence of social science to decide cases uh, because that was somehow like strains our stereotypes or strains the social prejudice against a, a specific group. And my second question is very basic and it always troubles me. It always troubles me. Uh, the, the social science evidence that is like a uh, descriptive arguments. And I wonder when it is a good time because this descriptive claims is so um, like it's very sound. So we can say this is also a normality argument that can that, that we can say. OK, <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, I think that there are increasingly are going to be a lot of actually the United States Supreme Court has uh, not been big on using social science uh, at all. The current uh, the current court. So, I mean, a lot of the issues are simply uh, moral questions and the empirical data just don't uh, address what is simply morally wrong. You can do a survey how many, and ask how many people believe this is morally wrong, but really it's just the nine people on the Supreme Court, it's their uh, view and people usually don't do surveys of those nine people. So, and I didn't quite get your second point. Could you possibly repeat that? Yes. And so because my English is not that good, uh, my question is the the social science evidence, they are like a uh, descriptive claims. They are they are they are saying that how the world is going on. But I know there's a difference between the descriptive arguments and the normality arguments, like yeah. how things should be. So when I, I also have a question is is like when we can say that because the discrepancy evidence exists. So we can say this is also, also the normality. It, it should also be our normality arguments. I wonder if you can get this. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that um, it depends very much uh, on the court. And if you look now at the United States Supreme Court, there are certainly a majority of people, oftentimes six people who, uh, rarely ever use social science research and just decide these things on a, a non-empirical moral basis. And then there's three or four justices that think this since that this is just wrong and that uh, research should be, when the research exists and when the research is good, it should be used rather than uh, intuitive kinds of approaches. And I mean, a lot of this depends on the uh, Supreme Court, certainly by the time uh, 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, the desegregation of uh, the schools when the Supreme Court relied heavily on research. And many, many of the judges looked at empirical research and the effects of segregated schools. Um, we don't find that kind of uh, emphasis on research now that we found then until the court uh, becomes more uh, amenable to a use of research. I don't know what's going to happen in the uh, in the short run. Thank you. We've got Shi Wei next. Hi, thank you, Hi. Professor Monahan, for an interesting talk. So, I, I mean, I was going to ask something along the lines of what Song Chun asked. Uh, basically, like since we've discussed today a lot of the positive aspects of using social sciences in 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 legal questions uh, like like you mentioned uh, you, you brought up many examples of how we do use these uh, empirical uh, empirical evidence but um yeah we we um so yeah but but we uh, in your talk you didn't really uh, comment too much on, about like the normative aspect of whether what uh, of, of whether we should be using such evidence right and also like what kinds uh like what kind of values that um that 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 this um tendency uh, well not tendency uh, like what kind of values this urge to use social science evidence uh, uh represents right so I was wondering if you could like um, sort of comment on uh give, give some comments of on what we're doing here at law of science right like our objective here is to like incorporate empirical evidence in our research and so. Um, do you think uh so 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 do you think this is still like an objective worth pursuing or and also like uh what are, are your recommendations given the light of like the of what you just said about the supreme the supreme court's um sort of like moving away from using empirical evidence right 
Oh, great. Uh, well, I guess I think the area uh, uh, that I would talk about that I really love the best is trademarks because uh, it's just clear you want people to understand what the trademark is and you want people not to be confused. There's no big moral issues in some of the studies. I mean, it's a store teen toys versus store war toys. Well, I mean, who really cares? It's just not a big, huge moral issue. It's just what people understand various things to uh, to be, right? Um, but as so I think the trademarks is just great because people just, the only people who get upset are the people who maybe are going to lose their trademark rights. But there's no big, huge moral issues. Nobody's really making the case that consumers should be confused. Whereas in some of the other issues, I mean, whether their empirical data should be taken into account, I mean, is, is very contentious in the court. For some people, they think that uh, it really is an empirical issue that, that arises, but other people think, and indeed now probably a majority of the Supreme Court, is not so big on empirical research anymore. So there it gets really uh, morally uh, problematic. What, what factors should you take into account, morally take into account? Is a is a big issue, and it's much much more problematic. The only I don't know of anybody who's opposed to empirical research in trademark law, but there's lots of people opposed to empirical research on, uh, say, uh, racial discrimination, for example. What should you take uh, into account uh, in doing that? So I think that's a uh, that's a real issue, and as and as you get the more uh, you get involved in the, the moral issues. And in some ways, the less uh, some people really care about what the research says. Okay. So we've got one question from the chat. Uh, sorry that I interrupt you. That's fine. Um, so we've got a question from Napas Kamon, who is asking about the outcome of the pretrial at risk assessment. She's asking whether the people who are part of the sample in the pretrial risk assessment study were released on cash bail or electronic monitoring? Right. I think that uh, varies tremendously by state. There's now a movement in terms of bail is to get away from cash bail because cash bail obviously is biased against people who don't have cash, right? So it shouldn't be the fact that they're poor or that they're not making it. Whereas you shouldn't allow rich people to uh, be able to do everything. It was one thing that was in the paper yesterday and some rich guy that was uh, tried for I think infringement of something and I think his bail was something like six million dollars which he could afford right but um that's that's what the court wanted to be really sure he was going to actually show up so I think that uh, uh now there's a big movement against uh, money bail and really we should be concerned account is a, are you going to skip town? You're going to get, or B, which could be even worse, are you going to commit a new crime again right away? And uh, that I think is the. Uh, there was something in the paper today. Uh, Taylor Swift, somebody how the singer, somebody was in jail because he was threatening her. They let him out this afternoon, and within 20 minutes he was back in front of her house. So that guy's not getting out again. Let's see, mm -hmm. that's him. They're going to put him away. Since they know that's not going to work, and God knows what he's going, what he's going to do in that circumstance. So I guess those are my uh, thoughts on that. So uh, Napaskawa follows up with an observation and a second question. She says that she's a judge from Thailand, and she was helping uh, the Thai judiciary set up the pre-trial risk assessment program. And from her experience, judges tend to be reluctant to rely on the pretrial risk assessment score. So she's asking, how can we convince judges to use these scores more? Uh, that's a really great question. And I think that that's, uh, what the reality is, is that if the person is released and commits a new violent crime right away, even if they scored very low on this uh, risk assessment instrument, the judges fear that they are going to be uh, held responsible. And if, if it's an elected judge and then the next election, the, the opponent is going to say, look, she had this murderer in jail and she just decided to let him out. And there's really, I don't know what we can actually do about that. You can't change you know, judicial elections and people, you can't say you your opponent can't take this into account. But I think that judges 
uh, when I've taught judges in this stuff, I mean, they worry a lot about getting, they're worried for two reasons. One, if I get it wrong, somebody's going to get hurt and that's going to be terrible. But the other one is someone's actually going to be blamed and it's going to be me because my opponent is going to think, here, we had the bad guy in jail and we let him or her out and look what happens. Don't reelect this person, for example. So I think that those are uh, really, that's a huge problem. I don't know how you can possibly uh, resolve it unless you had some separate agency that had nothing to do with judges, maybe make that uh, decision, but I'm not sure what else you do with it. Simon? Yes, um, it's more like a reflection on sort of the discussion um, going on here. Um, because um, I think also like in the um, sort of the AI field, it is um, it is heavily sort of evidence-based, but at the same time, there's a lot of sort of moral sort of discussion there. And I think one of the, the major question uh, that I often encounter um, is how do you address systemic issue when there's strong evidence that can support the other way? And, and going back to the algorithmic bias part, um, there might be black communities that um, maybe their neighbors are uh, more uh, inclined to commit crime. And I think one of those assessment has that as a factor. Um, but then if you solely based on that as an indication of whether, you know, the, you know, whether that person is going to commit um, crime again, then the result would be that community will, will be continue to be identified as uh, a place with high crime rate. Um, but then, and 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 then, when I'm thinking about this through the lens of critical studies, then they offer like a very um, sort of different observation. So, so I've been thinking about how to rust, kind of how to um, sort of think about these the same question through these um, two lenses. And I, but I still find the discussion very insightful in terms of the the fact that if judge or at least scholars can be more um, can be more acceptive with scientific evidence and I think that in general that we should head on a uh, better <laughs> direction, um, at least in legal academy. So those are some some thoughts yeah. that was sort of right. in my mind. Yeah, no, those are all good points. Uh, there's no way in the world uh, that you are going to be able to uh, use race as a risk factor uh, in this country uh, directly. I mean, it just doesn't happen, uh, and which is great. I mean, it would be horrendous to include uh, race. But of course, then, as you imply, all kinds of things correlate with race. And if you could use neighborhood, for example, if you use neighborhood, that would correlate in many cities tremendously with race. Well, you, you know, if they live in a, a, a say, a much poorer neighborhood. The big issue now, the one big issue now, is gender. And from what I mentioned before, I mean, there's no question that gender is an enormous predictor of enormous numbers of uh, crime. I mean, especially take, for example, uh, rape as a crime. To use gender as a predictor of rape, there were uh, some thousands and thousands of men who committed rape last year, and the number of women was uh, a couple of uh, 20 or 30. And in fact, even those people that weren't that women committed rape, they were girlfriends of males who were in gangs, and they went out and they kind of got met other women whom they brought back to the gang, told them they were going to a party, and then they were raped there. So there are uh, issues of, I mean, and, and if you look at, as we talked about, the racial differences in crime, I mean, not to take, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, gender differences in crime, not to take gender into account as a risk factor, I mean, scientifically would be just kind of totally goofy. But I mean, a lot of the writings of the American Civil Liberties Union is we just shouldn't take it into account. We don't care if it predicts. We simply just shouldn't be able to do that. Well, I mean, the more variables you're just taking off the table and say, we can't use this, we can't use that, we can't use uh, another thing, then the less accurate the prediction is going to uh, be. So I think that there are huge political uh, differences here. And every variable that actually predicts that you take off the table, you're going to reduce the accuracy, reduce predict predictive accuracy, and, and that is a problem, a big problem. Yeah. So unfortunately, we have run out of time, but before I let you all go, could you please just turn on your cameras 
And Simon's going to take a screenshot just for com to commemorate this very interesting talk we had together. Also, uh, Professor Monaghan, can you please uh, stop sharing your screen uh, so that we can- No, which? Uh, stop stop. sharing yeah. my screen. Uh, uh, yeah, stop sharing your screen, I think. Okay, and let's see. Oh, stop sharing. Great, great. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, we had we had a lot of people coming in and out. <laughs> but okay. Glad to have all of these folks uh, sticking this to is, the well, this, is and... this is wow. This is great. <laughs> yeah. All right. One, two, three. All right. Let's take um another one. Okay. One, two, three. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Professor Monahan, for this tantalizing conversation. Thank you. Hopefully, we'll see our participants coming back. For We have so many events planned for the spring semester, so please, please join us. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thanks.